All right, so we're ready to go. Um, so good evening and welcome to the fourth community conversation about race that the town is hosting in co-sponsorship with the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Um, tonight's conversation is about elevating suppressed voices. And so here we're holding a space for voices of color in Arlington to both identify and discuss experiences living and working in town and being a part of the community. Um, today's session is primarily about listening and connecting to the wider Arlington community through story and shared experience. Um, this session will not have a Q&A as it is a space for listening and reflecting. Um, and so we're gonna go over some ground rules, which we typically do. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to Alenta, who is going to do that. And then after that, we'll go into some introductions. Hello everyone, my name is Alexa Michelle and I'm a consultant with the town of Arlington. I'd like to just first um, start off by thanking everyone for, for joining us today. Um, I know that these are difficult conversations, but they're also very important conversations for us to move forward and build the kind of uh, diverse and inclusive community that we all want. Uh, just to start with some ground rules, um, I'm gonna invite everyone to take breaths. Um, the stories that you're about to hear are the actual stories from participants, and some of them are raw, so we want to be able to honor and respect that um, and to um, take some time to consider the, the fact that folks are putting themselves out there. Um, so I'm going to invite us to take to all take some deep breaths together and out, and to remind ourselves to take deep breaths um, throughout the, the time um, that we're going to be on this journey together. I also want to invite everyone uh, viewing to take a moment to think about a time when you were disenfranchised or if you've ever felt undervalued, uh, because a lot of people have felt that um, and on account of their race or their background, and we all can relate to having experiences where we felt disenfranchised. Um, and I want you to orient that yourselves to that idea as we engage in these experiences and practice some empathy. I also want you to remind you that um, that the the session is being recorded and so it will be posted um, on the town website and ACMI um, and there'll be an opportunity to uh, ask questions and address these questions in future formats. Uh, but for now, we want to just focus this time as a listening session um, and to really create space to listen to our guest uh, panelists. And I'll pass it back to Jill. Great, thanks, Jill. Um, so we've got those ground rules and we're getting ourselves grounded. And so tonight I wanna introduce the folks that we have with us. Um, so I, you know me by now, I'm Jill. I'm the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Coordinator um, for the town. Um, and Alensa Michelle is with us from Powerful Pathways. Um, we also have Margaret Creedle Thomas, who is the Met Co-Director for Arlington Public Schools. And we also have Heidi Bailey and Sifo Mangsu. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Let me know if I didn't. <laughs> um, Mangsu. Mangsu. Yeah. Mangsu. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they are the owners of a local business reparation. Um, tonight, we've also had a number of submissions, so I'm going to pass it over to Crystal, who's going to go over that segment. Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal Haynes from the Arlington Human Rights Commission um, and also the events working group lead. So if you want to help plan some events in town, I'm the place to, to go for that. Um, just wanted to let you know what the process was. We had asked people of color to submit stories of their experiences, either written or in video form. And we received a wide range of responses. Um, we'll be reading some of the written submissions and playing any uh, video submissions. Some folks wanted to remain anonymous and we respect that. Others wanted us to read their names. Um, we sent out a call of submissions on various social media platforms, the town's website, and sent it out to APS parents. We acknowledge that additional channels of communication are needed to reach uh, our most underrepresented community members. And that is something that we're working on. Uh, we wanted to remind everyone watching again that every story is from that person's perspective and that perspective should really be respected and in that frame we wanted to uh, start with uh, a specific uh, submission 
that really um, helps sort of encapsulate the need for these types of conversations to be had here in Arlington. So based on community feedback, we framed a conversation into sub questions. And first we wanted to get all of your reactions to that submission. Um, if you just bear with me, I'm gonna pass it to Jill to read the question. Unmute would help, I should know this by now. <laughs> um, so the first submission we got was from a concerned parent, and it reads, this letter is a response to the email sent to the Arlington school system regarding voices of people of color that go unheard or are being drowned out, etc." <clears throat> I have lived in Arlington all my life, married a woman of color and have two children currently attending two different schools in Arlington. My children currently have close friends that are African American, Hispanic, Chinese, Korean, Mexican, Indian, and Pakistani as well as those of white European ancestry. I am not aware of any persons of color in Arlington who has been denied education, employment, or service at any store in Arlington. I ask both my children if race or politics have ever come up in any discussion with their friends, and they replied, never. I appreciate the fact that racism ob obviously exists and we have, to work to, we have work to do nationally on this problem, but in Arlington, I'm hoping that this is not a discussion about teaching our children of color that the system does not allow them to succeed or work hard and the system is rigged against them. Nor do I hope that this discussion is about teaching our remaining children that they should live with guilt and shame for historical racial inequality and that this country is inherently bad. We have the most successfully integrated society in the world. This country is not perfect, but at least we are trying to improve. We are not living in the 60s. We are very different now. Racism should never be tolerated, but there is no country in the world that gives its citizens and immigrants the opportunity to be successful if they are willing to work hard. Let's make an effort to unite and not divide. Focus on the positive. <clears throat> so let's take a little bit of time uh, to hear the reaction from everyone. Have you experienced these types of sentiments before? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like that. It, 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 that was a whole lot. Um, and I guess where I go is like. Like if the, I guess where I would start is if your if your children are saying that they've never had conversations about race, then that's a problem, because um, these conversations I, I feel like are are should be happening and they should be happening very very young and if they're not mm -hmm. happening, at, from a very young age and your kids aren't talking about it, it means that your children have already learned um, through osmosis through just living in in an area or in in the boston in the entire boston area and like not just arlington specific but just in the entire boston area that these are conversations that are off limits and that they're not supposed to be had and not only has your children um been learned that through osmosis but all of the children from all of the different backgrounds that you just spoke about have also been given that message and therein lies the problem um, because however integrated we are we are still very much segregated and black people live in a very different america and it really makes me think about kamal bell and his show that he just had on where he said you know when he was a kid he had to worry about being um being arrested whereas now as a black man he has to worry about being killed I think also what, what was troubling for me is some of these, these um, 
terms that, that I think people of color often hear. I can't be racist because I have a black friend or I can't be racist because my children play with brown kids. And I think that that is absolutely a, a statement of racism, if, if I can speak to that, because you have to recognize, you have to see color in order to address the um, historical inequity and harm that has been, been done in our society. And so by perpetuating willful ignorance, I think that we are not getting to the root of the problem and we are not being truly um, forward facing in dealing with the fact that there are people in our community, us pos included that have these instances that have met a person that says that they can't be racism, racist and then deal with a microaggression at work or deal with a microaggression at the gas station or deal with a microaggression at the library. And I think that it's so dangerous to, to ignore these issues just by saying, oh, well, I let my kids play with some brown, some other brown kids, so I can't be racist. Um, I, I think, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say, I have to agree with Heidi and Crystal. Um, and for me as an African, not African-American, like coming, I'm from South Africa, coming into America and like with my kids going to school with people who say, we don't see color, we have black friends, we have, I came and I say I saw how different things were, and that that conversations you have to have with your kids. We are you can't say you don't see you have to see color. There's a problem if you say you don't see color. Then you know you gotta have your conversations with your kids, and um, I think they they need to start as early as possible. I I mean I think I agree with everyone. I um, Crystal, you mentioned microaggressions. Um, that as a as as an African American woman, I meet with every day. Um, the other thing is sometimes I think we have to um, define what we mean by racism, right? Because you have personal racism and then you have institutional racism. Mm -hmm. um, and so a definition that Beverly Daniel Tatum uses in her book, um, "Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting in the Cafeteria Together?" is it's race is power plus privilege. So when you have privilege and that's on um, you know those are when doors just open for you automatically whereas for some of us you have to push doors open so I think we have to start defining what does racism mean what does implicit bias mean what do we mean by institutional racism racism when we're talking about we're talking about policies and we're talking about practices and I think we need to stop being surface about our conversations and we need to start delving deeper into I think that is a great way to open up this conversation. Um, so what we're gonna move into is this um, idea around what Arlington is and how welcoming it is. And so um, we'll get to some questions. We did get a video submission around that. So we're gonna share that first where um, a community member does speak to that. Hi, my name is Brian Kang. I live in Arlington. And uh, the topic I'd like to talk about is um, my experience as an immigrant coming to the United States when I was five. Um, growing up in a family uh, from South Korea, East Asia, uh, and how a um, combination of the way my parents expected me to be, which was someone who um, always uh, thought of other people, for example, first, uh, along with the way I was viewed by uh, my school, my peers, my communities, my, my neighborhood, and et cetera, um, how the, the combination of those things and the way I looked really made it hard for me to have a voice and really made it hard to um, really realize who I was as an individual. And um, how to make myself heard without uh, feeling shame, which is uh, a big part of East Asian culture. And so um, I, I guess overall, I'd just like to talk about that, share my experience uh, with the town so that they can they get to know me better. And uh, yeah, it would give me a chance to 
um, share my voice, and my experience, and what uh, it's been like living in the United States as well as uh, living in this town for the past 15 years. And um, yeah, thank you for your um, this opportunity and for uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. So we had that and we had a few other um, narratives that were submitted that did center around the idea of welcoming. Um, and so Alessa is gonna read one of them and then I'll read the next one and we'll get into some discussions and hear about your experiences too. All right. So, this is uh, from someone who chose to remain anonymous and is a concerned parent. Um, and sa it says, uh, this is a response. Sorry. The next one, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, folks, just to uh, bear with me for a moment. Excuse me. In daily interactions at a store, I can never be sure how I would be treated, kindly or coldly. When I place an order over the phone and my order is delayed, I don't know if it is because I'm a person of color. Several years ago, one of the committees connected to Robbins Library, either Robbins Library or Foundations or another group, was looking for people to join them. I had put my name down and contact information, but I never heard back. Was it because of a lack of follow through or because I'm a person of color? There is that often uncertainty. And then another one that was submitted that the person asked to be anonymous was, um, as an individual in the marginalized group, I didn't know choosing Arlington as a, as a community to live in would have such a terrible choice and unwelcoming place um, to be even after residing here for so many years. Here in Arlington as a person of color, I've always felt unsafe, excluded, isolated, um, offended, I've been the victim of oppression, systemic racism, and racial attacks um, with threats and harassment, intimidation, racial name calling, bias, and more, in and more intimidation. I describe my experience as something happening across the board, and it's not an isolated one-off incident as it's been felt everywhere in this town. It's like the air that I breathe from going to town hall to pay a bill, to request information, to when I do need to call APD in an emergency situation, um, to being put in fear by white neighbors who have been harassing me for years. As a result, I must leave as a prisoner in my, I must live as a prisoner in my own home out of fear, um, out of fear of getting hurt by my neighbors. And yet I feel that my concerns are dismissed and minimized. And though for me, it's serious and sickening as I live with fear of this neighbor day in and day out with no end in sight and there's no justice because I'm a person of color. In one of the most recent racially motivated attacks, I heard the neighbor say, if you don't like it N word, just leave. This is a white neighborhood and referred to white power and said, this is America. I sadly realized that <clears throat> living black in Arlington is no different than living black in the deep South. Even after living here for many years, I still feel unsafe and continue to have these sentiments of fear in this community as biased discrimination and threats, racial profiling, exclusion, and unequal treatment have persisted and gotten worse. And this is not, and it's not a coincidence that systemic racism is now considered a public health crisis as I feel to my stomach every day that I have to deal with it in this community. And this would, and at this time would like to see real action, not just words. Enough is enough, let's do something and do something now. Um, so again, that's some really intense experiences that, pe that this person has encountered day in and day out. Um, and I'd like to discuss with you all if you are able to resonate with any of these experiences or just share with us what your thoughts are around that and in, in your relation to Arlington. Do you feel like you were welcome here if you were born here, if you moved here, um, and what it's like, what it's like for you. Um, so I've 
work in the schools and I don't live in Arlington. Um, have I had some situations in the community? Yes, I, I think of one uh, during the elections. Um, we had had our professional development day, so there was no, there wasn't any school. After lunch break, my staff and I decided that we were going to walk down to um, Not Your Average Joe's to have lunch. Um, it was for me a time where I just started to feel uncomfortable because just walking down the street, we we could tell that we were being looked at, um, we were being stared at. We get into Not Your Average Joe's and um, we're waiting for the hostess to um, let us know, you know, how many. Um, does not say anything to us. Another uh, customer comes in who happened to be a white man and you would have thought you weren't standing there. Um, ask the white man, how can he be helped? Um, one of my staff members was like, are we staying? And I said, no. Um, we then walked further down to Common Ground to have lunch. And I remember all of sitting there and just feeling very uncomfortable um, being in the town that day. Um, and just even walking back was, you know, let's just say we walked very quickly back <laughs> to school. Um, I think I was very, um, I was at a point that day that I was appreciative that I could get in my car and drive back into a city where I live, where I can see people like me. And I needed that that day. Thank you. Definitely, you're able to speak to that experience and feeling that discomfort, I'm sure, is something that happens more frequently than people realize. Um, does anyone else? Heidi, Sifo? I'm, I'm as, as you're saying that, I'm like, that's not a new thing. Right. Um, I, I, I'm from Cambridge, originally. Um, but I spent a lot of time in Arlington as a child. I went to the Arlington Boys and Girls Club. And I mean, the, the incidents are too, are, are too many to name just growing up um, with my family. I found it extremely curious that the majority of kids of color that were going to the Arlington Boys and Girls Club were not from Arlington. They were from West Medford. That's, there's something to be said in that. Um, I also, I mean, again, there were there were many incidents like just us riding the bus, like you knew when you were in Arlington, um, from comments of like, "What are what are you doing on this bus?" Like I, I, that happened quite frequently. Like, why why are you even here? Um, there was a there was not a freedom of movement um, once you once you crossed the um, line. Uh, there's definitely a different feeling between being in Cambridge and being in Arlington. Um, but there's also a different feeling in being in Cambridge and then like going into Boston. Like, I feel like that's like, there's, there's this unpeeling, this feeling of, uh, I understand, like of being able to breathe a little bit easier and, and, and feeling safe, even in areas where people assume that you're that these aren't safe areas, you know. Um, for me, they, they they are safe. There is this idea of being in. I guess with the last woman that was speaking, like I, that that of what you said, I, I think a lot about the idea of how of of like the similarities between being in the deep south and and being up here, and and I guess what I think about is that like the difference between up here and the deep south is, like it's not in your face. Like you, you have those instances of it being in your face, but then you're told, what are you talking about? Like it's it, like, like you're not believed that these situations happen because how could they happen? Because you're in the North, but in actuality, like there was slavery up here too. And, and, and it's just the, the, the racism that happens up here is um, more insidious because it's so covert. And it's so undercover, and I, I mean, again, that, and it makes me think of Trevor Noah. Like, and when they, if you if you want to know what racism feels like in Boston, 
look up Trevor Noah, look up Wokey the Warrus. That's 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 like a way to see it and I guess be able to laugh a little. Like it, it makes it palatable when you when you see that one. Yeah. And and for me, funny you she mentions Trevor Noah. I'm from South Africa, it's Trevor Noah. So I don't know whether it makes it easier for me to deal with or oh, I miss some of the things because South Africa, I mean, with the like Trevor says, the the head of like we had apartheid. So I feel like uh when I say like I'm from South Africa, I don't know whether it, it makes it harder the way I'm treated or like you know, or I just like I'm like I've been through this, I've seen this, like I and I dismiss some of the things. So with me having no experience growing in America and like, you know, I, 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 I could say I deal with it better in a way. Like I see the fake smiles and like I get the, the little like stuff that you get, but I think I'm able to deal with it or I just like dismiss it like that. I think also um, for me, I experience sort of two levels of privilege that can sometimes buffer that uh, experience of otherness for me. Um, certainly I can go into a store and if I have my hair tied up in a certain way and I look at certain my people like, who, who is this? Does she live here? Do you live here? But uh, I married into a very well-known family here in Arlington. And when I'm with them or when I'm in spaces that know that I'm married into this certain family, it's a completely different experience. And if I am dressed like this walking in Arlington and people recognize me from television, I experience a different level of, of reaction from people. So it, it's, interesting to, it's interesting to me that within the span of like a week or even a day, depending on how early I get done with work, I can have three different types of experiences in town. And I think that, that that's the issue, right? Like we need, every person needs to be able to walk into a town and feel welcome and not be looked at the other. But I think that that's certainly been my experience um, in Arlington. Great. Really helpful. Um, and that kind of helps us transition to the next set of questions and topic areas. So we're gonna transition into working in Arlington and for you all owning a business what that is like. And we do have, we got some submissions around, you know, treatment in businesses um, and how it feels. And so part of that we'll be discussing, you know, how you treat your customers, what your expectations are, what experiences you've had. And um, so Lindsay's is gonna read one submission we got and then we'll jump into some questions. Alrighty. So one story that uh, was submitted anonymously says, some of the people I work with do not take what I say seriously, or they need to check with someone else before considering my input as valid, or they just ignore me. Such as just recently, a group of us were trying to organize some documents by date. One person looked at a document and put it under the wrong gear. When I pointed it out twice, I was totally ignored. The third time I asked her to look at the document again and she just said, oh, other times there some would argue, would like to argue with me how something ought to be done even when the directions and instructions are clearly stated. When I realize I am right and they are surprised, why? The message I get is that they generally don't think I know what I am talking about. I know this happens to women in general, but it happens more often to women of color. The second story we got is uh, also anonymous, is there are also those who think that because I am a person of color, my English is not good or good enough or even strange in quotations. And when they make a mistake in uh, what is said or written, and when they make a set of what is said or written, they point to my English so they don't have to admit their mistakes. One person I work with always likes to make the assumption without checking and then she talks and makes decisions out of her unchecked assumptions. One time she did the same thing. And when I pointed out to her that she had the wrong information because she had made the wrong assumption and she realized it was, instead of admitting that what she did, she just said, my way of understanding English is strange. 
Thanks for reading those, Alenza. Um, so those are reflective of some experiences that have happened in the workplace. And I know Heidi and Sifo, you are in a situation in which you have created your workspace. Um, and so I want to just ask you, you know, um, one, have you had those types of experiences in the past, but also um, for you in setting up your own business, how are you instituting changes so things like that may not happen? Or how are you, what are you thinking would be some best practices to alleviate that? Oh, there are so many best practices. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even think I, like, I can't even, cry. like, I'm trying to scratch the surface and figure out, like, what would be the one or two. And I, I mean, first of all, we have to dismantle institutional racism. And we, like, that, I don't, like, where do we start with that? I, I mean, that's kind of where our store came from, is this, I, um, like, it's where our store came from is is out of a need uh, of of needing centers needing spaces anywhere really that are black centered that are not white centered and 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 also i think the best practice is to understand is is first starting with that understanding that almost every space you go into is a white centered space like uh, unless unless you're unless you're going again to our side of town or our our neighborhoods or our like places that that because of redlining which mm -hmm. is another form of institutional racism unless you go into spaces that are predominantly black you are in a white centered space and those of us who are black or of color are experiment experiencing these things all the time like all those things that you mentioned we most of us have experienced at one point or time or another in spaces that are that are not black centered. Um, I think that that was a big reason why we why we wanted a space like reparations to exist or felt like we needed a space like reparations to exist outside of right in Arlington, right in, like in the white space in a white mm -hmm. in a space that is white, mm -hmm. like that that is considered a white centered space, and we and we are very clear and un unapologetic about the fact that reparations when you walk in the door is a black centered space and um no one's trying to hurt your feelings but your yeah. feelings may get hurt nobody's trying like it, it, it's a space that is um it's a space for us to feel comfortable and i'm unapologetic about that i think what you're saying is it's a space for a minute and someone to understand your walk when you when we create spaces like that um, and I know that students need spaces like that also and adults um, of color need spaces like that because when you when you meet with microaggressions on a daily basis you do not want to continuously explain to someone the story you want somebody to understand when you say it that the first thing they do they'll you know they'll give you that, that expression on their face like I totally understand you know how you felt um, and I think also sometimes we need that validation I think um, someone said that I constantly do it myself I'm always feeling like I have to dot my eyes and cross my T's um, I feel like if I go do some meetings I want to make sure that I am um, sounding intelligent that I know what I'm talking about um, and this is all in, in regards to, but like you said, the institutional racism that has um, been the foundation. And then when you're, a, when you're a Af and I'm an African-American um, Hispanic woman because my mother came here from Honduras um, without a high school education. And so she raised daughters that have master's degrees. And to still feel as though you have to dot I's and cross T's when you're in spaces with other people, um, that speaks volumes. So if we feel that way, right, as adults, what are the students feeling when they go into classrooms? So I think what you're saying, and this is, I'm, I'm all for it, What a, we all need affinity spaces. But, and I think, I, and I think, and I think, you know, Heidi, to your point, you all are sort of modeling uh, the type of, of customer service experience that people of color would like, right? Yeah. I know I can go in your store and not be followed. 
I know I can go in your store and, and find what I need in that space because you've been intentional about every type of person in the community that may walk into your space, yes. right? And then I know you're going to look me in the eye and treat me with respect like, like any other person that comes into your store. So I think, I think your store model, it could serve as a model for other businesses in town. Yeah, treating yeah. everybody like they're human, um, regardless of who you are um, or what, what you look like, what your skin looks like. And I also found it, like, as far as business, like, on that business end, I, I, I find it very interesting um, how people come into the store. Like, like, uh, like when, when Black people and people of color come into the store, it's a... Like a, there's a store here that that caters to my needs. There's a store in there's actually a store in Arlington that mm -hmm. caters to the needs of me and my community and my family. And whereas when white people come into our store, there is um, however much it's like, yay, we're so proud of you and we want to support you. There is um, it's it's tainted. Like that's the only word. Why I can did use. you guys choose? Why to be did in you Arlington? choose to why? be in Arlington? Yeah. When why would you there's not a lot of black people in Arlington. Mm -hmm. Why would you choose to be here? Yeah. Like with suspicion, it's tainted with suspicion. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. Instead of like, wow, Arlington makes there. There's there's this population, however small. Like, oh, and you're you're coming here to cater mm -hmm. to this population. Mm -hmm. Of course we are. Isn't that mm -hmm. a good business mm -hmm. practice? If nobody is catering to this population to have a store and it's one store of many it's one store in the entire town of 50,000 plus people so yeah. why would yeah. you be yeah. here like because there's black people here no they like yeah um so that that's i guess just a observation i have a question for all of you and i'm hoping you all can chime in um it, I was actually just having a conversation with a friend of mine uh, yesterday, um, and he was saying how he feels like there has to be multiple versions of himself in order to navigate different spaces. Um, so he's like, there's a home Elijah, and then there's a work Elijah, and then there's other space Elijah. Have you ever felt like you've had to sort of wear these different sides or code switch? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Just driving down 128, you know, so leaving my neighborhood and then driving and feeling like I, I need to change into a professional Margaret um, and leave the authentic, the real, real Margaret at home um, because now I'm going into a professional space. And I need to say, it, it, it's a lot of mental fatigue sometimes when you know that you have to be a certain way. Um, you know, there are times that things have happened, microaggressions have happened to me that I've had to get in my car, or I, I either will call my husband or my sister because I know that in the car I can let out that emotion that I need to let out because the other, that's the other piece. You're, you, you have to be cautious about not letting that type of emotion be shown to certain people because, again, I don't want to be labeled, right? The angry, oh, she, she, she got offended by that? Oh, the angry black woman. Um, so then it's either I'm going into my office and closing my door and doing it. And I, I do need to say this. I do have some really um, close friends that I work with that I know now. Like, and those are friendships that I had to build, right, at work, that sometimes I can either go in their office and kind of and be the market that I need to be within that workspace. But that took a moment to do that because you have to build relationships that you trust that being vulnerable in somebody they're not going to use it against you and i think that's where as people of color we have to be concerned about sometimes when we are you know when we're in a meeting and we're being passionate about something it's called anger not passion right um so there's different words that are used for us when we show different emotions and so yes when I leave my home, I, you know, I'm, I have to change who Margaret is. So I, I do do a lot of code switching constantly, um, whether that's, you know, being the director of the program or being my son's um, mother. You know, you always have to do it when you're a person of color. Right. 
I, I can't agree with you more. It's like there's there's the there's the there's the me at home. There is the me that drops my daughter off at her at her school, and there's the me that then goes to work. And all three of them are different. And I would say that that's not just um, it's not just a race thing. Like it's not just me having to um, be safe. Like they're like within with just just based on uh, my race, but then also how I have to code switch based on um, class. Like if, if I if I'm dropping my daughter off at at her independent school, there, there's a, there's another class piece that also has to um, slide into that as well, and it's exhausting. And I, for me personally, it was um, for the last five years I've been making a conscious effort to not code switch. Um, after the first Black Lives Matter movement happened was when that happened because what I realized is that I am not helping. I am not uh, I am not helping my child, helping my grandchildren in any way if I um, if I continue to code switch it to make others feel comfortable. So I'm trying to find ways to be my authentic self everywhere I go but this is after a lifetime of being trained having it like of, of a learned behavior in order to survive so yeah yeah I'm just like I may not be contributing as much because I'm coming from like outside and some of the things I, I just like, you know, I don't code switch because maybe I don't know as in a situation that I would have needed to, or like, I don't. And then I learn a lot sometimes from her. I've been learning a lot the past four years and she's been, she, she's been like, you know, coaching me and like just showing me. So I miss some of the things because, um, I've, I've only, I'm always myself. I try to not be, I don't want to be in that space where I have to like act like a different person that I'm not because people are going to treat me a certain way if I show up a, so yeah, I try to live my, my, my authentic and be in, even but, in spaces when I'm expected to. But you're also allowed you know? to, to a certain extent because you're South African. I think there's you're that not as black. well. You're 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 a model minority, which I way. yeah, which I miss. And she is like, well, you, but I'm like, they don't do it to me. And she's like, remember, they don't treat you the same way as they treat like a black African. I mean, and it's something that I I don't realize until. So she's been telling me she like I how get your children differently. are going to be treated, how your son is yeah, going to be treated yeah. because they are going to be raised. They are, they are going to be African American. And it the accent me. isn't there. The 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 pass. They mm. they 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 won't get the pass that um. It scares me. What you know? What I have to learn and what's gonna happen now that I'm in America and I'm raising my kids in America. Yeah. Mm. The, yeah, I think um, I mentioned before about the three people that I present in town. Um, I think for me, I grew up. Uh, you know, I was, it was my sister and I, and my, I was raised by a single mother who struggled with mental illness. And so code switching was absolutely not a choice. It was, a, it was a matter of survival to get her through the mental health system that is broken in America to work at an early age and get a job and convince someone to pay me to, to make, and then, and then getting into different social programs to get to a scholarship to college and to get uh, work through the financial aid process and then get a career where I speak on television and I have to look a certain way and I have to speak a certain way because otherwise the message that I present will not be received in the way that it is meant no matter how many folks at the station or at the place Please. that I work at believe in what I'm saying. And so I think, you know, having to code switch definitely has a weathering effect. I think being the model minority was, while it was key to my survival as a kid, it strips away pieces of your blackness, of your personal identity, 
that then you have to reconcile as an adult and decide how to, if you want to, and when to reclaim that blackness in a way that now allows you to still be the professional that people need you to be. And so I think that the complexity of being a person of color, being a black woman, um, is one that is so difficult to wrap your arms around, and especially if you don't have that lived experience to compare it to. And I do want to say, like, I want to 100% acknowledge in this that being biracial, black and white, I have an amount of privilege. And I am extremely aware of that because my daughter does not. Like, um, so. Great. Thank you. That's a lot. And I do have, I guess, a follow up question. I'm um, just circling back to, you know, reclaiming. And I guess, what are some ways that, you know, you, Heidi, you're, you're being yourself. So how are you putting those reminders in for yourself to do that? Um, because it is, it's difficult. I do it every day. I'm struggling. <laughs> but I'm similarly trying to do that that I'm not having to code switch. Um, but I'm curious as to if folks who are trying to stop that habit, what what are some of the things that you are doing? I think there's an amount of sitting in the discomfort of speaking up when I know that of knowing when to that that I that I that I can speak up and that I am gonna be heard um, and acknowledging that in those moments, like when I'm in predominantly white spaces and I am speaking, um, putting into that, yes, I acknowledge my privilege. And, and it, it and putting my, I, I, I mean, I, one thing that really comes to mind for me, like as we're saying this, is I was recently at a, at a not recently, in January, in December, I was at a conference for, um, people of color in independent schools. It's a giant conference. There's like 5,000 people that like 7,000 this year, but there, there's a lot of like four educators of color in independent schools and really forcing myself to at that conference, like they have affinity groups in those spaces and being like, and trying and acknowledging that I am, that I pass in, in, in a, and, and how do I use that to, um, to move, things forward and so what I had to confront for myself or where I'm at in my journey is 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 confronting the fact that that of the privilege that I get because of my skin color because I wash out significantly in the winter and um, so I went to the white people affinity group and having conversations with white people um, as a as a white person, I, the way that I went into it as a white person with a black round, um, and what does that mean? And 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 really trying to have those authentic conversations um, with the experiences that I've that I have that I I've had as as a person with a black round, as a person that under that that and understanding again that my my child is not having the same life that I, is not getting the passes, is not getting the, and, and that's what constantly goes through my mind when I'm trying to, um, when I want to code switch. Like, I code switch, like, I, I have to figure out a way to, to, we have to start having these conversations and, and sit in our discomfort. And, and those of us who do have that privilege, because I'm acknowledging that in a very real way, not everybody does. I think in the position that I'm in, I, I have to have difficult conversations every day. Um, I think depending on the situation and a circumstance, sometimes I have to sit and process how should I go about in having the conversation. Um, there are times that, I, you know, now, my seventh year in Arlington, I feel like I've established some really good relationships 
that if something does happen, I support certain people. I feel like I can go to them personally and say, can we have a conversation? Um, I, I know your intention might have been, and it had an impact on me, or if it's in regards to a student. Um, sometimes, like I said, depending on the circumstance and the situation, I then think about who can I use as my allies in Arlington now to, to get some changes done. Um, and I can never, ever say that I can't um, speak up. I think I do a calculation in my head, depending on the, um, you know, the, the venue that I'm in. So if it's a venue that I feel really like, you know what, I can say what I need to say here, I'm going to say it. If it's a venue that I'm like, you know what, I'm not sure. Um, however, I know that I have two allies sitting at the table, then I need to talk to them about, you know, I, I need you to say this. I need you to be the one to speak up because sometimes it always is us, right? And sometimes this is where we have to push our white allies and say, no, I need you to use your privilege. I do need you to use your power in order to get some things changed for me and for the students. Um, and so that for me is every single day. I think I've learned how to be a mathematician though of which, which strategy I need to use, right? In order to get things done and to get things changed. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing all of that. That's really um, insightful to see what you're doing in your own lives and how your, what your perspectives are on that. Um, so we're going to, so we've talked about, you know, kids and that things are different for different families, different parents, and so, um, we're going to go into some of the testimonials that we got um, from students. So we did get a large number. We are um, looking at the time right now. We have about a half an hour left. And so we're going to discuss some action steps after we talk about schools. Um, but I want to know that, you know, these conversations are going to continue and opportunities for sharing are going to continue. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read one of the um, testimonials that we got from a student <clears throat> who wants to remain anonymous um, and says, I want everyone to know that just because we live in a liberal town doesn't mean that there's not racism and discrimination happening right in front of us. Whether it's having to see the N-word written in school or explaining to teachers and students that no, I'm not in the Metco program. I actually live in Arlington. It's all around us. And just because you don't see or experience it doesn't mean it's not happening. I'm going into my senior year of high school at Arlington High. I've been in the Arlington public school system since kindergarten. This past school year, junior year, was the first year when going on a field trip, I wasn't asked if the cost would be an issue or if I needed help paying for it. While it seems like the teachers were just being nice, I want to point out that none of my white classmates were asked if the cost would be an issue for them. I think it shows the implicit bias that teachers have about black students. Like just because I'm black doesn't mean that I can't pay a $30 charge for a field trip to the Museum of Science. Um, so that was one narrative we got. We did get a number from students and parents and then um, Crystal's gonna share a piece that she had with an alum. Yeah, I, I interviewed him because he, he preferred it that way. So pardon me if I look a little rough in it. <laughs> As I've gotten older, at the time when I was younger, I felt like the town was welcoming, especially I always played sports and it just it felt like I was a spy monitor and I was along with it. But recently I've gotten like, so I, I work for a bread company in Cambridge. And right now we've been doing like home deliveries because of COVID and we're trying to reach the elderly and trying to help them out so they don't leave the house. And I like volunteered to do some deliveries. And we've been going to Arlington. I was like, well, I want to go to Arlington. And I kind of like got a weird feeling. I was like, wow. I, it was more about the people that, like, were out, that I was around and they, they kind of included me. And we were a family, but I'm not from Arlington. Like this isn't who I am. You know, I was just, I was a spy funder at that time and I developed and I made friends. But it kind of, that's what it came down to. So it was just sort of a hand, a handful of people that made your experience. Well, how would you describe it as a positive one or? 
in that sense at that time, yes, for sure. Uh, but All right. Um, Georgia, so I grew up in the neighborhood. You just, everybody knows everybody. You know, everybody's parents. You just, and all of a sudden, you kind of like, when a friend invites you to their house after school, it's like, oh my God, it's like, he's actually my friend. It, it, it makes a difference. You hear from some of the kids, especially kids of color, black kids, Latinx kids in Arlington, that that, so, so that they are, didn't have this positive experience, whether they're next to students or not. Um, did you ever have any negative experiences? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was always a, a feeling, and a lot of times it was certain teachers that made you feel that way, that you were just the kid that got dropped off on the bus at a certain time. You know what I mean? Like, and it was really sad. It's tough. It, again, I tried not to have that view. I tried not to, but I, when I look back, I had, like, aggression as a child. I had there certain things that I, I couldn't explain at the time that I look back now, and I'm like, I can't be mad at myself for, for feeling a certain way or feeling different when that's how I was living and that's how I was being treated. What do you think that districts like Arlington can do to be better, to be more welcoming to kids of color from town, kids of color who bust in Mecca? I would say that I, I would have liked to take part in certain things in the community. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't even parts of Arlington that I know or things that I knew with my friends or sports, but like, I didn't really know the community, you know, like, I, you know, I'm not, so I would have liked to be a more part of, maybe even like a town day if we like, it was like a Mecco portion to celebrate Mecco, you know what I mean, something, just something that would make me feel like, wow, I am from Arlington, like, not from Arlington, but I'm a part of this community. Thank you, Frank, so yeah, so I think I think the, those were very two very different experiences. Um, I happen to know Todd because he's a friend of my husband's, and um, he used to say I'm from Arlington when he was going to school. That's what he used to say to people. So he had such a positive experience there, and he told me, as an adult, he those things change as he puts it into perspective. If he hadn't had a few key people, and then I think about if he had walked into reparations after school, if he would have felt more connected. Or you know, had it had his at the time, the Mecco director was great for him, and that created a positive experience. So, as we talk about the experiences in school and our kids, I mean, how do how do we think we can do better? I, I think we have to believe what students say when they say they experience, whether that be in you know. Um, microaggressions in the classroom, in the hallway, in the community. I think, you know, sometimes we we don't validate, right? We don't validate their voices. Um, you know, as we're having this forum, it's like we're elevating, right? Suppressed voices. I think it's the same for the students. I think students do say things and it's either brushed aside. I know that um, my students at the high school, you know, I, I like to call them family meetings that we have. And those are the times that they can be themselves and just tell me what is actually going on. And that's when I really hear some things that they're experiencing. Um, and then they choose sometimes whether or not they want to say something to me because I can get into action mode. <laughs> um, and so I've had to learn how to say to them, how do you want to handle this? because I had to understand that they have to go back into that classroom, right? I don't go back in with them. And so if they tell me, I got it, this is what I'm do doing, I tell them, great. And they always know that they can check in with me. Um, <laughs> I feel like my students have me on speed dial, so they'll text me in a minute, like, are you in the building? I need to talk. So I think sometimes as long as students know that they have if they know that they have one connection in the building, it doesn't necessarily always have to be that person of color. If they know that they have that one person that will hear them, will listen, um, and will help them through that, I, I, I think that's where we need to start um, when we talk about how can we make it different for students. And I, and I really believe that we have to believe what they're saying. 
and not minimize the story. I think as adults, sometimes we minimize what students say as their experience. I can absolutely relate um, to that. You know, for years I worked as a METCO student tutor and mentor. Um, and, and largely a lot of the, the stories that I heard from students is what eventually led me to go into racial equity consulting. Um, and we got a lot of submissions from um, students who were, or parents of students who were in the MECO program or, or students. And one thing that I often heard when I um, worked as a student tutor and mentor is that a lot of students felt that they were being um, misperceived by um, by, by teachers, by their faculty, by the administration. There was a lot of um, assumptions that were placed on them that because they came from other communities that somehow they were less intelligent or they were inept or somehow sort of more wild or violent. And so people treated them that way, even if they didn't actually say it, students were still picking up on that. So my question to all of you are, if there were uh, perceptions that you would like to see changed about people of color, what message would you, sh would you share to um, white allies? Assuming that you know, everyone in the town, this is a progressive town, we all want you know, the right things, but there are also a lot of assumptions and things that we absorb over time. So what are some, um, some facades that you'd like to break about uh, perceptions about people of color? Um, I, I just want to say that because I work with a population that lives in the Boston area, that I need people to understand that we do own houses here, um, that we do have professional um, families, um, whether they own their own business. Um, we do have families that have graduated from college, that have not only college degrees, but they have masters. I have some parents that have doctorate degrees. I think sometimes it's like, are you, you know, for my population, I'm, I, I want to be like, are you willing to venture into their neighborhood and see where they live? Because maybe then that will help for you to dismissify the stereotypes that you might have about them and you might view them in a different way. And I'm sorry that that has to be done in order for you to get the understanding. I always feel like stereotypes, um, implicit bias is like, having missing pieces of puzzle and that we need to now um, have those puzzle pieces to, to make the picture really what it is. Um, and not, as you said, go on the assumptions. Um, you know, the students in my program, they're intelligent. Um, they, you know, we have students that have creativity in various different ways. And we also need to celebrate that also. And I think that's the other thing I wanna say. Um, I think, you know, when I have conversations with students, it's like, I feel like I'm giving them affirmations, even though they don't know it's affirmations, right? Because it feels like you have to continuously put those deposits back into them because of where, you know, that they're in these classrooms or in the hallways, um, just experiencing different things. So for me, as I live here in Boston, maybe it's, let's take a field trip. Maybe it's for you to get up at five o'clock in the morning and see how it does feel for them to get on a bus and come to your neighborhood. Um, I'm all for that, but sometimes you have to walk in somebody's shoes in order to understand their story. Yes, yeah. yes, 100%. Um, I guess for me, like, this is a little controversial, but um, MECO in itself for me is a problem. It's, it's problematic. Um, I feel like, when they created the MECO program, they should have done it differently. They should have, instead of busing children out of um, our community, our best and our brightest out of our community and putting them into communities where they're treated uh, as less than, we should have done it the opposite and we should have bused white kids in and we need to, how about creating, um, how about creating schools that are, that, that, that help that where, that, that they don't need to be bused out. How about that? Um, so that being said, um, I also feel like an assumption is that um, trauma can be um, seen as anger. 
that 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 a lot of times, um, you know, what when when you when you when as a white person, if you're assuming somebody's angry, understand that that's that's trauma that that you're seeing. So, uh, I guess those are the those are the two things. I, I just I know too many people who were were some of the first medco kids that were bussed out, and um, it destroyed community. Like like you said, in these in in these predominantly black communities, there are doctors, there are lawyers, there are dentists, there are homeowners, there are there are these are communities, and Meco bus the best and the brightest out. And when they and when these kids go into communities like Arlington, um, you do what you do to survive, and, and 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 that's the best for our children. That's the best that we can get. But we shouldn't have to bust out because what happens is these kids don't come back because for their entire lives they're told that well, well their their educational lives they're told that their communities aren't good enough. I think also what, oh, sorry, sorry, Margaret. I think yeah, also to speak to the, the young lady, or um, I apologize, I'm not sure what, what um, gender she she or he identifies as, but the, the person, the young person that was in Arlington who was told, was mistaken for a METCO student, and that was considered a pejorative, like that was bad, that they were considered a METCO student because they were being treated a certain way. So. So now they've associated being black with Mecca and Mecca with something bad. And so I think what, what keeps running in my mind is the last thing that Octavio said was like, how come Mecca kids aren't, you know, uh, invited to town day? Why aren't they invited into the community as a whole? And so I think about solutions like that, like making the invisible visible and like Heidi said, recognize, reckoning with if that's uncomfortable, like what that feels like. Because I think that that's how you sort of dismantle the young kid. And I think in terms of the perception, I mean, I think the the perception that I've, that I have come across the most is that I am not from here. The assumption is that I'm not from here, that I must have been priced out of Cambridge to live here or priced out of JC to live here. And then that, and that because I'm a transplant, um, I, I th like black people can't be from Arlington. We must have been busted. Or we live in the projects. I live in East Arlington. We're near one of the housing developments. So much of that that person must be from the project. So I think that these are all perceptions like that that need to be broken down in town. And also the response to those perceptions. Because it can run the gamut from like a patronizing. Um, oh, woe is you, you must be oppressed to to outright racism. And so I think we have to be forward facing in that as well. I think what I wanted to say about in regards to the METCO program, we have to remember it started out of busing um, and it, it's, it's a racial imbalance act, right? And that there were some parents in Boston that they were looking for a better education for their children. Um, and I think, um, for, and, and so I don't, I don't call the students in the MECO program MECO students. I call them Arlington Public School students who are participating in a program because that's how, that's how they need to be viewed. They are Arlington Public School students, right? And, um, and there are some benefits, let's be clear, that Arlington is getting from having these students come into their community. Um, this, and I hear what you're saying. This is not just one way. They are, they are experiencing some risk diversity when these students come in to their community and bring their culture and their language um, that I think everybody needs to be exposed to. I, I, I mean, if we look at the statistics right now, the majority is not white, right? The majority is looking very colorful. Um, and so we have to learn how to, to walk in that world. Um, so I know that if I have former students that they are proud to have been part of a MECO program because of what they, the experience they got. And I do have some students that the program did not work for them, right? So the program did not work for everybody. I think sometimes we have to remember what the history was in regards to the MECO program and why it was created. Um, 
and why it still exists. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that helps us shift to kind of one of the final questions around, you know, where do we go from here? So we've shared these experiences, we've seen these things that are happening in town, um, and we want to know how can we do better. Um, and some of the testimonies, you know, there was comments around there needs to be more diversity in town government. Um, you know, implicit bias is real. It is harmful. Um, so how do we take these things and move forward and set up some action steps for us? Um, and I know Alenta can speak to that a little bit, but would love to hear from folks what you think. Um, the rules of engagement have to change. Um, I think that uh, I think that the first step to any real change is um, there has to be a common language, which means we actually have to be talking about it so everybody knows what the terms are, whether it's model minority, implicit bias, explicit bias, racism. Like we have to have a we we have to actually we have to start naming it and having a common understanding of what these terms actually mean. I think that that that's a first step across the board or else people are like, well, you know, what does racism really mean? Is it, is it really, you know, like we, we so that that in and of is, is a first step in, in towards dismantling it. Um, there has to be more conversation. Um, I also think spaces have to be made for, for specifically for black women because we are the most marginalized and, and there has to, and that has to be acknowledged. Um, those would be my, my, And that's why we opened like also, we hoping we can have those conversations and reparations. People can come in and we can discuss all of the difficult conversations, people kind of race, culture, you know, class, class, class is a, is an, is another uh, one that need, like these are conversations that need to, that we that we have to start having we have to acknowledge there has to be an acknowledgement yeah. that, that we have a problem i think um uh, i think we're in a time where um uh, white folks are sort of listening a little bit more they're leaning in a little bit more and sometimes that can feel like the woke olympics and, and we are, as black people are being recruited as coaches. Um, and so I think we have to sort of, I think we should also be sort of thoughtful about our own biases uh, as, as black people, because black people are not a monolith and that's not what we're, what we're trying to do today. Um, but also think about how we experience racism, how other people of color experience racism. And then I think we have to, I think white people who are watching this should also be very introspective on if they're competing in the woke Olympics because they are having an awakening, a true awakening, or are they doing it for show? And what effect and what damage that does to the communities of color that need you to be an accomplice and not a social media asset. And so I think that's what I experience the most I'm, I'm in the space where, where I get a lot of homework from, from my white friends. Um, and so I, 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 I want to invite folks to do their own studying first. So, at least, um, and so I think, I think where we go from here is for, for everyone to just be a little bit more introspective about how am I biased? How do I experience racism? How do I perpetuate racism? Because I think that that's even the most woke or even the most non-racist plain person does contribute to a system of systemic racism. And I think we have to be thoughtful about what kind of cog in the machine we are. And I think what you're saying, Crystal, is that we, 
I don't need rescuers. I need allies. I don't need um, people to think that they need to rescue us. I need people that can sit at a table because you have influence that you can get some policies and practices changed. Um, so that's what I want to put out there to the community is that you want to know how you can help. You can help by using your power, your influence, and your privilege to start getting some things changed. And I always say to people, do you want me to have a piece of your pie? Or is it that you're going to still cut it for me and tell me that this is all you want me to have? And so I'm going to go back to the definition I said about racism that Beverly Daniel Kahn talks about. It's power plus privilege. So you have power and privilege that go along with that. So that's what I would, would I would say. So as you're in spaces and be aware of the voices you're not hearing in the room. And if you're not hearing those voices, you be the one. Don't tell me to come to the meeting. You be the one to say something. Don't wait for me to walk in the room. And you be the one to say, you know what? We need to do something. And the other thing I'm looking for, I'm looking for white people to push white people. Because it's always us trying to push the white people. I am now looking for my allies to push their white friends and their and, and the people that they know um, in those spaces also. As you say that, it makes me think of um, there's a woman named Bettina Love, Dr. Bettina Love, Dr. Love. Mm -hmm. And what she says is, I don't need allies. I need co-conspirators. I need you to be an abolitionist. And I, 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 that's that's what I'm hearing. Like I, I don't need I don't need you to cut it for me. I, I need you to to be right there with me. I need you to I need you to be there even when I'm not. I need you to take ownership of it um, as your own. So, thank you. I would just um, one. I would agree with everything that was shared, and I would. Um, would say two particular things. I think the first step really is about building one's own individual awareness. Um, to Crystal's point, you know, the, the the communities of color have their own work to do in healing with each other, but that is only exacerbated and further um, suppressed through systems of racism and white supremacy. And I think we have a lot of work to do, especially if you are someone who likes to think of yourself as a white ally and assuming the best of intentions, then that means everyone needs to make an effort to go out and educate themselves. Um, you have to be willing to, as Ibram X. Kendi describes in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, you can't just say you're not a racist, you have to be an anti-racist, which means you're actively pursuing education and supporting communities of color to achieve real equality. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around equality and equity. I think people need to educate themselves about the difference between those two terms. Because if we're not on equal footing, then we can't ever achieve equality. And that's really where equity comes in. It gets us to the place where we can finally be at the same level. Um, equity as, uh, takes us to a place where we assume, where we recognize that um, not everybody has been given the same amount of opportunities. And there's a whole history for that, right? We talked in our uh, previous session around race and housing that while, while there were not any red lines around Arlington, that doesn't necessarily mean that Arlington wasn't redlined. That meant that people of color were intentionally kept out of the town, which has then led to the, tr the, the trickle effect is we're now dealing with a lot of uh, people who are uncomfortable when they see people of color. They don't know how to react. They don't know how to handle it. And for those who are uncomfortable, you need to challenge yourselves to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You need to ask more questions. You need to step out of your comfort zone. And that's not necessarily saying that you have to make any sort of wild big leaps, right? You know, if you've never been to Roxbury, you don't have to say, my first exposure to people of color is I'm gonna go to Roxbury. But maybe your first exposure is to talk to your neighbor and to have a conversation with your neighbor and learn some tools. Uh, ask more questions. Am I fully understanding that? Assume that you need to continue to learn more because we all could continue to learn more. And as you go through that process, make sure that you're also asking, how can I be a better ally? Challenge your relatives. You know, we all have that uncle 
at, at the dinner table who says something offensive. Be willing and be have the courage to challenge those statements, to push back on those uh, conversations, to challenge yourself when you think about uh, those things. When you react to someone out of fear, as opposed to recognizing that you just don't understand them or you don't know where they're coming from, challenge yourself to think about that. Because at the end of the day, we are all individuals who are part of a broader network. We, are, we have uh, thoughts and ideas that are absorbed and passed on to us that we then spread between our social networks, which then infiltrate the institutions that we're a part of, and then that ideology then continues to be perpetuated. It's the concept call that um, is often referred to as the four eyes, the ideolog ideological, institutional, interpersonal, individual, but it's a cyclical process. And so we have to recognize that we're all a part of it. Like we're all in these systems, so we can't get away from that. And especially to, um, our white counterparts, you have to recognize that one, that, that you have absorbed privilege, even if you came from a bootstrap background, just by the sheer skin tone, you have privilege. There are things that you get to walk through in life that people of color just don't get to. And you have to be willing to empathize and try to do your part in creating equality, even in the smallest ways. And I think that's the that's really the first step is the process of building your awareness and then applying that to action through policy, through activities, through um, holding people accountable in different institutions and spaces because systems would not systemic racism would not exist if there weren't people upholding that system. So we have to recognize you first you have to recognize that it does exist, recognize your own part in it, and then take efforts and be active in your communities to address it. That was great. <laughs> I've got my homework to do. <laughs> I think we all do. Um, this was really wonderful and I'm glad that we were able to come together to have this discussion. And now we've got our action items. We're gonna go out there, self-reflect and self-educate. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, again, this session was one, it was the first we're going to be continuing these types of conversations. Um, I know with this community conversation series, we're in this virtual, we're, we're testing out this virtual space right now um, and we'll be staying in it, but moving forward, we're gonna be working on ways to be able to have more engagement and more conversation. Um, but just as a reminder, this is being recorded so you can go back and watch it. It will be posted um, for the submissions that we did receive. Thank you community members for submitting those. Um, I do believe that Crystal in the events group at the Human Rights Commission um, will be continuing to, to take submissions because they're looking to build off of that as well. Um, I know the schools are going to be doing something similar, so look out for that. I know this will be coming soon. Um, so we're, we're entering the space where we're looking to have more of these difficult conversations because they need to be had. Um, so again, I want to thank everyone. If anyone has anything else they need to add, feel free to. Um, but I think we might close it out for the night. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.